no, 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 you can keep going. <coughs> he has several different things he has to start. You only have one. <coughs> um, tonight, uh, what I'd like to do is, instead of proceeding on with the next psalm that the Lord would have me do, I'd like to... Um, in a certain sense, follow up and bring in some more uh, reality from the Lord on what we've been sharing. And I want to do that based on <clears throat> a category that I called, um, uh, I don't really call it anything, I'm thinking of a name right now, uh, <laughs> common uh, threads that run through the Psalms. And um, <clears throat> Tonight, I want to, you know, we, we've talked about um, the um, civil court, and we've talked about being a priest and all of that. <clears throat> and I want to just bring out several different scriptures, so I'm not, and they're in Psalms, um, the, the primary ones, to show that this is a theme that runs all the way through the Psalms, uh, what I'm about to deal with. And is a, um, uh, in relationship to some of the things that we were talking about. <clears throat> so to start with, let's go to Psalm uh, 7. And we're going to read uh, just verse 15 and 16. Psalm 7. He made a pit and digged it, and has fallen into, into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. How many of you know what a pate is? Raise your hand. Okay, you can see the difference in the education thing. We had to learn a poem that used that word when we were in school, and you didn't. Uh, but if you were a, a strong follower of Shakespeare, then it would have nothing to do with what we're talking about. I just wondered if you were a strong follower of Shakespeare. <clears throat> All right. What you, um, what you see here is that the psalmist is, <clears throat> is bringing out a point very simple and very clear. The, his enemy made a pit and digged it. He dug a pit and he did that and, and one of the themes of this area we're going to be in is going to be in relationship to the word pit. Uh, it, that, it, that a pit is what the enemy will consistently be digging to cause you to fall into. Okay. And so David's enemies made a pit and they digged it, but it says that he has fallen into the ditch which he made. Okay? And then when it addresses his mischief, his mischief shall return upon his own head. Uh, his violent dealing shall come down again upon his own head. It's just that the Psalms are in the category of poetical books, and to be poetical, you don't use the same word to describe it. Even though this isn't rhyming poetry, it is, they do tend to uh, change things up. And so, um, just from that first one, we began to catch a glimpse of where I'm going with this. That the enemy is going to be a victim of his own plot. Okay? It's going to be a victim of his own plot. Now, just a few psalms over, Psalm 9. And again, verse 15 and 16. <clears throat> psalm 9, 15 and 16. The nations are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higayon Selah. 
<clears throat> and so um, here, th this theme and this view is expanded a little bit. Here we see um, not just the pit brought in, but the net. The net's, net which he hid is their own foot taken. But then it says, the Lord is known by the judgment which he executed the wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. See how that is one, almost one flow there? Um, it is certainly one sentence the way it is in our books. It's one sentence. It's not two separate sentences. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Okay. So what that's saying is, and what this, this is bringing in that the other one didn't do, this is, this is reaffirming that, that what the enemy's plot is, what he plots and what he plans and the evil that he thinks to do to you, he confirms that he will himself be caught in the very devices that he's using, okay? But then he brings in this other thing, which is verse 16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Okay. Do you see that he's saying, the Lord is known by his judgment which he executed, but he didn't execute anything. Uh, the enemy executed himself. If you understand. Okay. Right? Okay, but this is saying that that is one of the judgments of the Lord. In other words, the judge, the civil court judge even, is not making a decree against him in the sense of what we would think. The Lord, the judge is making a decree against you that since you did this, you know, other bad stuff's going to happen to you. The decree was made almost before the case began. Let's say that it was made before all cases began. What, what is the judgment? What is the decree? The decree is the wicked is snared by the work of his own hands. Settled. Released like the law of gravity, always at work. You with me? So God doesn't even have to intervene if you understand what I'm saying. Because these are situations of judgments in relationship to what some would call civil court. He doesn't even have to make a judgment. They w this is going to happen to them. There's a New Testament way of saying it that's a little differently. Anybody familiar with it? You reap what you sow. <laughs> you know. So this is, this is settled. Um, if you know that, then you know that uh, I, I saw some things years ago that made me make this statement. The kind of government you deserve is the kind of government you're going to get, meaning the, 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 the kind of government or the way that you're governed towards others is going to come back on you. Uh, only a few know the story that I'm going to describe without using anybody's names, but I <clears throat> am going to mention something that, that I knew about at the time and never shared with anyone, and I only know maybe one or two that it would even be able to guess who I'm talking about. <clears throat> but uh, there was a couple who, you know, there's more than that, but there was a particular couple who got upset with this church, and they went out and they said, okay, we are going to speak to everybody we can. We're going to visit them in their homes. Everybody that we ever remembered went to this church or we could ever find out that ever did and we're going to tell them terrible things about not so much this church as me. And so they did that. Um, I found out about it. Um, I never said anything to anybody about it 
in that sense. And then the, the wife happened to be a person who really did rule her husband. I mean, she ruled her husband and she tried to rule the church. And I didn't let her. And she didn't like it. Okay. And so they did this. And they went and they, they explained how they were both going to college now and that they were successful and all this kind of stuff. And it, for the period of time that this went on, they looked good and we looked bad and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but then a terrible thing happened that they, that they set in motion. And the husband ended up going to prison. And he ended up going to prison over a particular charge that right now, if you get out of prison, they track you everywhere you live, the police, the communities, they want to know if you're living in their community, everything they are. In other words, he went around and told everybody he's a bad person so everyone would think bad, but the, the extent of what has come back on him, will, will, which is the same thing, everybody's going to think bad about you, will follow him all of his life. And there's no place that he can hide from it. Now, this had nothing to do with anything I did. It had everything to do with what he did, whatever. And when he went to prison, his wife, who wanted to be the leader and wanted to tell him and everybody else what to do, the Lord said, okay, I'll let you be leader. Now, you provide for your home. You provide food. You provide transportation. You take care of all the needs. Your husband's going to be away now for many, 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 many years in prison. And it's like, I didn't want this. Well, I got news for you. You did want it because that's what you put in the ground. Does, does that make sense? I mean, you, you did. I mean, unless you just don't believe the word of God. And these, these were people who, as from my knowledge, had been serving the Lord in very early age. Um, if this, these verses are true, now let's forget that story and consider. If that's true, then folks, number one, you don't have to worry about what people do to you. Oh, yes, we worry in the moment because in the moment we do look bad. Do you understand? The question is, do we look bad to God? And who are we trying to please? Now, that's a hard one, okay? I know, and I'm, you know... I didn't come to it easily. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't just go, oh, yes, you know, sweet lamb laying on the altar. I was drugged, <laughs> screaming. <laughs> so there's no judgment coming from this boy to you, okay? I just want you to know. <laughs> and there's no condemnation. It's just that I have now learned. I have now learned, you know. And, it, and it, it, I had to be put in an impossible situation where I had no choice. Okay, I'm, I'm with you, Lord. Okay. So I don't want it to sound like I'm super spiritual because I'm not even barely spiritual. <clears throat> but I do want to say that this, this thing in, in the moment duh, is just excruciating and grievous, but... If you wait on the Lord, if you trust the Lord, and if you believe the word, and if you believe his judgments, then you know, I'm sorry. This stuff does follow you. It does. And it'll deal with them. And God does, and we'll get into that in a little more as we deal with a couple more scripture. God doesn't even have to lift a hand. Amazing. All right. Yes, where are you going? Right. And, and here's the judgment. The light is coming to the world, and God said, therefore, I'm going to kill all of you. And he said, no, no, no. Men, here's the judgment. Here's the judgment from God. Light came into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Be free. Right. It's a, it's a different kind of judgment than we think. It is. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Thank you. 
because, because it is. That's why I was bringing out that the way that that was worded is, this is the decree. I mean, it it's, would be the same judgment as if God said, let there be gravity. Or let there be electricity and let there be no, no forks or knives stuck in the socket. You understand what I'm saying? It's not, it's not personally malicious. It's just a law. It's just the way it is. And, you know, not forgetting all the other stuff that I've taught, and that is that the true judgment for us, folks, happened at the cross. Okay? So, you know, I, and I taught, a, I taught a class on Job, and I went very much over that to say if, that the greatest law in the universe is not you reap what you sow. The greatest law in the universe is the cross and the forgiveness of sins and, okay, and that's just a fact because God can, you know, God can change the thing. He can restore the years that the canker worm hath eaten, okay? So, but for them, folks, if they're not going to believe these things, guess what? That law is in place. If you have the law of aerodynamics, you know, I gave an example of the, uh, boats and stuff uh, in Ireland. They'll be way up, way up, you know, and I'll go, how are they going to get that big thing down to the water, you know? Well, when the tide comes in, it lifts that boat and it goes back out and there they go. They don't have to lift a thing. Or you can sit there and fight all day trying to get that big heavy boat, you know? If you work with his laws, his judgments, then they work. But if you don't know them and you just think, Life is about defending yourself or getting everything fixed so that you feel better about yourself. Ouch. Because you're bumping your head against laws or judgments that, that, are, gonna, that are going to turn around and bite you in the rear end. <clears throat> yes, you may. Amen. That was my favorite verse, actually, in the 60s. <laughs> However, I had to grow in the reality of, of what the seed was. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, let's go to Psalm 34, verse 19. Now this, you know, one of the things that I try to point out to you is that these are very unusual things the scriptures say. We have a mindset based on our lives before we met God of how things should go. And they don't go that way. They don't go that way. And these scriptures right here to me are just right along those lines. To sh that it's like drawing us into our own way, and then he just breaks the, the bubble. He pops the balloon. <clears throat> Verse 19 of uh, Psalm 34. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Anybody ever heard that scripture before? Oh, baby, me too. And in fact, every one of you have, and probably in every church in America they have, because everybody in America wants to be delivered from their afflictions. Well, first of all, notice that it says many. What we would really want is few, and that's God. You know, that's God when he delivers us from the few and keeps us, you know, delivers us from even having to go through anything. Oh, that's God. I'm sorry, that is not the God of the Bible. Okay. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but hey, praise God, at least we've got the, the following tag. But the Lord delivereth them out of them all. Next verse, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. We go, yeah, 
Folks, he was stabbed, slapped, spit on, crucified, nailed, spiked, whatever, uh, beer pulled out, but at least his bones weren't broken. So that's the deliverance that he got. God didn't, God did not save him from the cross. And I got news for you. In civil court, he may save you, but in his heart and in his way, he will not save you if it's the cross. Okay? And, and that because there's an important factor. Did you have your hand up? Or? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the scripture said that we are of his flesh and of his bones. Mm-hmm. And the flesh Ooh. was not delivered from the cross, but the bones were. And in that, as you said, Amen. Well, Amen. Did it seem like that was recording there with the little wave things, or could you tell? Good. Wonderful. Wonderful. I do appreciate, Shay, your voice comes out strong, and, and I appreciate that. So um, these are... Uh, I'm going to say it like this. These things are riddles unless you know the way of the Lord. Because when you know the way of the Lord, it's not all riddly. It's not all just, you know, you got to decipher it or it's a conundrum or whatever. There are clear-cut ways of the Lord, clear-cut. But here's why we get confused, and this is the honest truth, because we don't know the cross. I'm not talking about the event 2,000 years ago. I'm talking about the nature. I'm not talking about the piece of wood Jesus died on. I'm talking about the spirit that put him there, his own self-giving spirit, because there were the other guys on either side of him had two pieces of wood too. Oh, well, Jesus was, was more holy. You know, I mean, that's, that was the whole deal with the, with the Crusades when they went to Jerusalem, you know, and uh, they were fighting against the Muslims and everything. Well, one of the trinkets that they brought back was they found the original cross. And they brought back splinters from the original cross and spread them around. Folks, that's the problem. Most Christians, about all they get from the cross is a splinter. Okay? Oh, oh I'm hurt. Uh, you know, try going to the cross like Jesus did. Try being his flesh and his bones. Try being one with him. You know, it's going to be more than a splinter. Besides, a splinter from the actual, which we know, I'm sure it wasn't, because I'm sure that the Lord gives no credit to that. Um, Even if it was, it's no different than the wood off of any others, or off of a table, a bar, you know, table in a, you know, pub or something. It doesn't make any difference. What makes a difference is the spirit of the thing, the spirit of the reality. Do we have that or do we, like the Pharisees, understand all the, the explanations and everything, but when Jesus shows up, we don't, we don't get him. How, you know, we, we not only don't go, my God, this is the one about of whom everything pertains, they went, you're not even of God, and killed him. And in, and in doing it, what did they do? They fulfilled everything that was written of those who were against him, okay? Because they didn't know the cross. I mean, you know, may the Lord work in us that we are never a hand in seeing to it that the Son of God in somebody is crucified because we understand the word of the Lord. But how will you do that if you don't know if you don't know that this Jesus, this one, will always die as a criminal. And the case will be set. And if you don't know any, if you don't know spiritually, you'll listen to the ones who came and brought stuff against Jesus. Do you know what I'm saying? You'll listen to it and you go, well, it's got to be right. I mean, Nick said it, Nicodemus said that, or, you know, whoever, whatever, you know, somebody, you know, Barcomas. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> Some of you don't know Barcamaeus, so. Um, 
All right, we didn't even finish reading all of this. Uh, uh, many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. I, I thought it was interesting that it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Here it is, verse 21. Evil shall slay the wicked. Okay, listen to me carefully. The righteous don't have to slay them. <laughs> They don't have. God doesn't have to. Are you with me? Okay. Because we go, oh, they're getting away with something. They're not, oh my God, you need to pray for them. They're not getting away with anything. Maybe momentarily or something, but they're not, you know, there's nothing on it. It was just a thing. <clears throat> um, maybe momentarily, but they're not getting away with anything. Can I get an amen? Amen. They're not getting away, and God, and God doesn't even have to deal with it. Evil shall slay the wicked. Are you okay with God's judgment? Okay, good. It's, it's easy to be okay with those judgments now in a classroom. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from experience here. I knew these things. But when you get in the situation is where it counts. Yes, speak loudly and clearly and with the gusto of a hound dog. All right, speak. Well, amen. You cry out for their soul. I will say this. You really have to walk a fine line between praying them out of it. Because remember Moses said, you know, with um, Miriam, uh, you know, oh, Lord, just let her go. And he said, you know, no, you know, I mean, even if da-da-da-da, then this would happen. Um, but in other cases, the Lord did answer. What, is that, what does that even say to us? Well, it says to us that, folks, every situation, we need to walk with the living God. We don't know what the Lord's going to say and do, okay? And the very one that you might actually pray them out of the situation, you, you did the thing that's going to break them out of the shell, okay? <clears throat> God uses that stuff, too, you know? He, he used it for you, <laughs> and he'll use it for them. Okay, but the main thing is, more important than that is, in all of this stuff, I, you know, I can say, I can say, well, quote unquote, lay down your life and whatever. Folks, how you do that can be a multitude of ways, and you need to find out from the Lord what that means. I mean, when, I remember when I first started becoming a pastor, and the Lord told me, you need to go over there and talk to that person and deal with them about what they just did. And I I said, Lord, you know, I'd rather lay down my life. He said, that is laying down your life to do that, you know. And I went, boy, it really is because I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, I mean, in other words, I was hiding under a cloak of, uh, oh, I'm laying down my life by not. You see what I'm saying? So I'm just saying to you, stay in touch with the Lord. Okay, that's the main thing. Yes. Amen. Okay, let's, let's uh, finish reading this here. Uh, verse 21, Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. That's pretty powerful. And when you connect it to the next verse, it's even more powerful. 
The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them who trust in him shall be desolate. You notice both words there? Um, uh, basically, you know, it's continuing that thought of the, that the evil, their own evil is going to bring about their own end. But here, there's a little more to it. There's this sense of becoming desolate. Okay? And here's what I want to say to you. We can get to a place where all of a sudden we start feel like we're drying up and becoming desolate. And it's been my experience, and I know this isn't the only answer, and there's not one Band-Aid to fit every wound or one kind of pill. There's no magic pill that fits everything. But I've found over the years <clears throat> that if I allow unforgiveness in my life, that I start getting like desolate. And I, uh, I've often said this, but unforgiveness is a luxury you can't afford. And it's just that, it's a luxury. <laughs> And you shouldn't be trying for luxuries because it's going to kill you. Or it's going to, or if it doesn't kill you, it'll just it'll ruin your ministry because then God can't use you. It'll ruin you because then there's always this bitterness and there's always this stuff. And so, um, I realize that unforgiveness sometimes is very sneaky. Maybe I should say we're very sneaky because the scriptures talk more about us deceiving ourselves than the devil deceiving us. Okay. It does. Um, and we deceive ourselves and we allow for it and it will strangle, it'll put a stranglehold on you. It'll, it'll ruin you. So uh, the, the phrase that I've used a lot over the years is learn to keep short accounts. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to like what anybody did. Doesn't mean that you don't believe that their own evil will, you understand what I'm saying? That, that's, that doesn't require unforgiveness to, to believe that or to stand in that. Does that make sense? It, do, it doesn't require unforgiveness to believe their own evil is going to, you're just believing the word of God. And you're with the Lord. Okay? And you, and you know, being with the Lord in those things, it's important that you don't, you know, fool yourself. Yes, I do. So an issue of you can believe the Lord's word there, but not exult in it. You can even believe the Lord's word and see it and mourn for it and ask the Lord for, for a, a greater law to take place or a greater judgment to overcome. Right. Well, that's a good point because I <clears throat> that was one the Lord always dealt with me on, too. There are many scriptures that say this. You know, God is bringing judgment on somebody. He says, because, for example, Esau, uh, he said, when Israel was under attack and everything and they ran to uh, Edom, uh, Esau attacked them and gloried in their being attacked that was causing them to be chased. In other words, um, we're gloating. We're getting something out of it. You know, it would be the equivalent of, you know, like, gloating say if like Brett Favre went to the Vikings or something or oh I'm sorry no 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 <laughs> but it, but you understand what I'm saying I'm just jo I'm joking I am joking but but in in true reality in realities that that are secretly man we're glad you know and yet we can say we're with the Lord man we have got to learn to really evaluate, to have a Norton that evaluates what's at work in us. And most of us are so ready to, to go with our own way and our own mind and what pleases us that we just, we're just, in a sense, hardened to those things. Let the Lord deal with you. I, I can sit here and try to explain that, but here's what I found. Here's what I found. With every explanation I've ever given over the years, there's always been 
one or two or more who never got the explanation and that my explanation almost seemed to help them in what they thought, which was different. So I don't even know what to do anymore other than to say the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He loves us. He will teach us. Take these things to the Lord. Anything that I say, don't just grab hold of it. You know? I mean, I've said that from the very beginning. If everybody actually believed that and, I, and believed that I meant that, don't listen to me, go to the Word, try to find out from the Lord, then nobody would ever leave here and go, well, Randy teaches that. <laughs> well, I thought he said don't believe him. <laughs> and I would, be, I would be incredibly happy with that because that means everybody who got it would actually get it from the Lord, which is the way it's supposed to be, the actual real way it's supposed to be. So that would actually make me happy. <clears throat> All right, let's turn to Psalm 57. Psalm 57, we're still moving along this same line, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 6. Psalm 57, 4 through 6. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men, whose teeth are as spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. <clears throat> all right, let me just read my... Uh, words here. The soul is among lions, or the definition of lions, the sons of men. Their weapons are, are offensive. If you're familiar with football, you know that, that you play offense and defense, right? Everybody knows that? You play offense and defense. In the Lord's kingdom, if you become, if you go to the offense, you become offensive not joking here not just a play of words when you become offensive in your ways against people you become an offense you become offensive okay but defensive is just as wrong if it's if it's you know not the right spirit um, their weapons are offensive it is in their mouth we say that something is offensive when they are on the offense. We say that they are defensive when they defend themselves. This can't be just a situation, and this is why we, this is where, you know, in uh, uh, Exodus, this is where all that civil court was going on with Moses, and they were just dragging him from day and night, every day, every day, every day. Folks, when you, when it becomes an issue of defending yourself, you're already out of the main flow of what the Lord had in mind, okay? However, God, you know, I say God set it up. Jethro set it up. Golly, Jed. <clears throat> and, uh, and it helped. And it does help. And God does care on that front. Okay? But really, isn't being offensive or being an offense, just, isn't defensive being just as bad? Isn't it just the other end of the spectrum where you're defending yourself? It, couldn't that be the highest form of selfishness? Not that it always is. Or, as they would say in, in a political, being politically correct, not that there's anything wrong with being totally self-centered. <laughs> but but it, it absolutely could be that. It doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be that, but it could. And we can hide behind a cloak of maliciousness in using these things. Doggone it, folks. We're the ones who want Jesus. That's why we don't do this. We really are sincere. <laughs> you know? Oh, I mean, we mean this. We, you know, we, we're going to go and have gone and we'll go through incredible, horrible stuff. So the Lord can prove it in us that this is what we believe and who we are, not just our belief system. But think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to test you. And what is it? He, it there, what does it say? It's something like there's, there's uh, his greatest pleasure is that when we are tried and we come forth as gold. Gold in the scriptures represents deity. All the dross has been burned off. 
You know, we get upset when we go through the fire and we see all this dross come out, right? I do. Okay, maybe you don't. I mean, maybe, maybe your fire is just like a little tiny, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I see all this dross coming out. I go, oh, God, I hate this. I'm such a, I'm such a flake. I can't believe all Look at this dross, you know, and stuff. But, folks, the trial isn't just exposing that so that we'll go, oh, I'm dross-filled. I hate myself. I mean, do you ever see that in the scriptures where we're just supposed to go, I, I just hate myself, I just, you know. No, what it is is it's actually, the trial is actually bringing forth the gold, which means it's separating from the dross. The dross is coming out, but it's also being removed. It's also being exposed for what it is, exposed for what it is, and you don't really hate it until you've seen it in action against the Lord, and I, I have. And, man, you, you, however much you didn't want it before, now you really don't want it because you see how it is in you. And, and I will say this, sometimes you go through a trial, and then that trial, he simply brings forth the dross and doesn't scrape it off so that we see it, and we see a bunch of it, and we go, oh, God, and look, instead of bringing forth gold, I brought forth dross. And we totally fail in that one only to have him circle back around and bring you through that trial again and because you hated that dross and the stuff that came out of you so bad when you get there again you are in a new place of standing i don't i will not do that. god help me with all the grace you can give me i don't want to do that again and you actually make it through Amen. so the lord is gracious the Lord is merciful, and he is working to conform us to the image of Christ. And so if you don't know that, if you think you know it, and then you get in the trial and you go, well, oh, he just wants to show me how bad I am. That's not true. He, he will use that circumstance, and then it may be a while later, it may be a year, it may be whatever. He'll bring you back around, and he'll give you another shot at it. And because he brought you through the fire the first time the way he did, he did things in you that will help you the next time. And that's beautiful. That's grace and, and gracious. Yes. Yeah. Amen. 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 <clears throat> it's funny. This, this, these cameras are on me, and, and so when I, you raised your hand, I said yes. And when I pointed, you paused for a second, and the baby went, ah, like that. But they can't see that. All I could hear was the sound. and go, why is he calling on kids to make weird noises? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, okay, let me read a little bit, because how much time we got on that there machine? 17, which is about enough time to start reading. Um, we may look at God's way of judging evil men in that he allows them to be taken by their own devices as random. We, we'll, we see that action as random or his version of justice, okay? We talked about that. We may be willing to accept that method as okay because it is the way he has chosen to operate and at least those who are evil finally get what they deserve. But to take this approach makes us no different than normal men. Anybody can want an unjust situation to be resolved. Anybody can want an unjust situation to be. Anybody can react with a sense of injustice, including sinners. Can I get an amen, folks? Amen. Sinners are just as, in, you know, have that, maybe it's worse than we do on some fronts. <clears throat> Pardon? Karma. Yeah. Bad karma. <laughs> um, to, do, to do so does not bring any distinction between saved or unsaved, Christ or fallen men. But those who belong to Jesus cannot be satisfied with simply flowing with the ways of the world. We are told over and over in various places in Scripture, get ready, his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. Amen. Well, what, surely these thoughts of, of having justice are from God. Well, sinners having the same ones. Can I get an old me? <clears throat> All right. Uh, what if this principle of allowing evil men to build a pit for the innocent, but then they fall into, was not just a random principle, but based on something higher 
than just finally giving us justice? What if ultimately to him it was not an issue of who's right or wrong or who's wrong, but based on a reality that transcends the quarrels of men? Psalms 38. You know where I'm going with this. It's gonna, the, the word cross is going to come up somewhere, isn't it? <clears throat> All right, Psalm 38, and beginning with verse 12. This is David. Verse 12, they, all, they also who seek after my life lay snares for me, and they who seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. Okay, do you see how bad that is? Because what we've got here is they're seeking for his life, they're laying snares, they seek his hurt, as well as speak mischievous things and imagine deceits constantly and you know when that when you do that folks when you do that if you're one of those who does this stuff those imagined deceits become real to you did you know that if you lie like if you're a kid and you lie about something and then somebody asks you about it later the parent does again later and you lie about it again you lie about it again you your conscience is either going to get you or you convince yourself that that was really the way it went so you believe the lie yourself until you get to the point that this is this is the truth. Am I right or wrong? Okay. But I, like a deaf man, heard not. And I was like a dumb man who opened not his mouth. I know you'd say, well, that's dumb. Well, that's what he said. I was like a dumb man. You're right. Okay. Thus I was like a man who heareth not and in whose mouth are no reproofs. This is getting bad, isn't it? And verse 15, for in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord, my God. Um, somewhere in the midst of all of this, it needs to be raised. Well, let me just read it. What is the true spirit behind God's judgments? We have the situation of Haman and Mordecai in the book of Esther. Didn't y'all just recently in y'all's class with Debbie go, still are. The gallows that Haman made for Mordecai became his own undoing. Right? Amen? Okay. But there is this place for where it becomes Christ where um, you're like a deaf man. And, and I find it, you know, you can call this unspiritual or not. I find it better not to, you know, uh, like the Cowboys last year. If they read their own press, they would go, oh, we're going to go to the Super Bowl. Well, they didn't even make the playoffs. If, if you get attacked and all this stuff, I think it's the same. Uh, you know, if, you're, if they're writing all this good press, don't read it. If they're writing all this bad press, don't read it. Know who you are. Know who the Lord is. Trust the Lord. Okay? Because in most cases, reading it only stirs stuff up. Okay, just, I mean, it, you know, you're asking for junk to come up. Yes? Well, it's taking your focus. I mean, we'll take things for it. It takes your focus off of what your focus is supposed to be. It's to, like, that goal, that thing, that, that I mean, you can't exactly go, but what it is you have to do and accomplish. Amen. And it takes you off of that and it puts you on yourself. Amen. In verse 13, so I was like a deaf man. I didn't hear it. Okay. Next thing, I was like a dumb man who opened not his mouth. So you're deaf and dumb. I mean, according to this, you're deaf and dumb. Are you okay with being deaf and dumb? No, because that makes me look stupid. Oh, worse than stupid. It makes you look guilty. <clears throat> and, you know, and this, and, and I'm going to say this, this doesn't, you know, I, I, this applies when you're in flow with the Holy Spirit in relationship to Christ and Him crucified. If you're not, you're asking for torture and trouble and agony. And this is where failures have come in the past in relationship to the church here in Bible school is that people who did not see this, and it doesn't mean they're lesser or someone else is greater, it just means they didn't see it. They didn't see the reality of Christ in these things. And they thought that they were supposed to act this way 
And it's real hard to do it when, <laughs> when it's not Christ, okay? In fact, it's impossible. Or you can do it for a while, but eventually what happens is you explode. And we've had a few explosions over the years, okay? So let me just, <laughs> so let me just put it on this level. Don't explode. Just for, if you don't like what I'm sharing on this, forget it. It doesn't apply to you. Don't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean that is the truth and it really didn't come out of a selfish heart that's trying to save itself by saying don't kill me but that will be the end result but the truth is it doesn't apply to you it applies to those to whom it applies and those to whom it applies really understand it and they'll go with it are you okay with that I am I am all right. Um, Thus I was like a man who heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. How many? No, none. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. And this in thee is not, not just you, but in union with you. Because our hope, whether in trial and people persecuting you or not, our hope is in union with Christ. Or you could say, you know, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that union that takes place. <clears throat> All right, so. Uh, all right, in, in, uh, in Daniel 8, uh, or Daniel 3, verses 8 through 12, certain Chaldeans accused the three Hebrew children. You familiar with that? How much time we got on that there meter? How much? Nine, okay. I'm going to go ahead and try to quickly get through this instead of turning to Daniel in that case. Uh, but in Daniel, it's in chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Certain Chaldeans accused the three Hebrew children. In other words, I want you to know that the story there sounds like this. Now, y'all can correct me if that be necessary because I don't know everything and sometimes I miss it. That's why we're going to look up that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And so, um, you know, I'm open to that. But it appears to me that these three Hebrew children that when, you know, the, the king came out and, you know, and uh, there was the, the sound of the sack button, the dulcimer and instruments of music that everyone was supposed to fall down and worship this big idol and, and all this kind of stuff. And it, it, most of us, if we read that, we see the reason why those three guys got in trouble is when that happened, they didn't fall down and worship. But did you ever notice that prior to that, there were certain Chaldeans who went to the king over these guys. And they were just jealous. And so they told on them. So apparently, and I don't know how this can happen, I don't know how you can have the whole kingdom out there, music go, everybody fall on their face, and three guys regularly, you know, not go down and nobody noticed, but apparently it didn't happen until these guys brought it up. <laughs> That's the only way, I, you know, of course, it was a huge kingdom, so, you know, it's kind of like at the stadium. You can't even tell if everybody, if someone's standing up or not. <clears throat> um, but, but this time he noticed. And, of course, they got upset. And then uh, when the guys who got ready to throw them in, they made the fire, you know, seven times hotter, and it burned up the guys who were throwing them in there. And then at the end of it, they're saved, the Lord or, or the king sees a fourth man and says he looks like one like the Son of God in there. He sees Jesus instead of them. That's the goal. Amen. And he lets them go free. And then he takes the guys who, who tattletale, that's what we used to call it, and he threw them in there. No, sorry. All right. Um, And, and, interestingly enough, in uh, verse 28 through 30, they ended up more honored than they were before. Okay, because they weren't seeking honor except from God. Amen. All right, Daniel 6, 29. Now, this one deals with Daniel himself. Again, when Daniel was accused, and he was accused in Daniel 6, verses 4 and 15, 
He was thrown into the lion's den in verse 16. But he was preserved in verse 21 through 22. The means of destruction planned for Daniel became the method by which they died. At the end, see, the king didn't realize he was making a decree that was going to get Daniel in trouble because he liked Daniel. <laughs> but all these other people were jealous. So they came up with this thing, this plot, you know, not knowing that you're going to become a victim of your own plot, so stop plotting. Can I get amen? amen. Stop plotting. And so... He, they, you know, the king is sad about putting him in there, so he throws him in there. He spends the night. He doesn't sleep good. And the next morning, he gets up early, goes and says, hey, you know. Uh, that happened with the fiery furnace situation, too. And he was okay. And he goes, oh, boy, your God. You know, the king's talking about how great his God is. you got to love that. And uh, so let's see. Uh, the destruction plan for Daniel became the method by which they died, verse 24, six, Daniel 6, 24. All right. Those are just a few examples. There are, the Bible's full of them, but yes, Lord. Is, is there more you want me to bring up? <laughs> However, these and many other stories in the Bible are only shadows of the true. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Is a shadow a complete, a complete, clear picture? Is it? No. Okay. So, the very cross that the enemies planned for Jesus became the means of his own downfall. Became the means of the enemy's downfall. What is it? First Corinthians uh, chapter two, verse. Six, had the had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Right. Same thing happened. The cross that they that the enemy planned to get rid of Jesus ended up destroying the enemy, right? Yes. Okay, so we've seen that pattern over and over in Daniel and different scriptures, uh, Esther and whatever. Um, let's see, uh, it, is, it is not the wisdom of this world, but hidden wisdom. And, and the scriptures there in 1 Corinthians 2 describe this as hidden wisdom, this secret means of life coming out of death. Hidden wisdom. Here's my question before Mallory comments. Is it hidden from you? No. Do you even know what I'm talking about? <laughs> 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 Amen. Right. Amen. Which, interestingly enough, is this principle. That's why we're on what I'm talking about now. It, the cross is this principle of the, the thing that they plot is going to come back on them. Do you see how that's actually the cross? that they, the enemy planned the cross for Jesus and it ended up being the, the destruction of them and the enemy. And um, so it's important to see that through the eyes of the cross. Yes, God has other means for you if you're not in that position, but we are right there. Okay, I need to finish because either that's the peace sign back there or we got two minutes left. <laughs> All right. And I only have one paragraph left. There is one primary difference between Jesus' case and that of Mordecai or Daniel. One primary difference. They never fell into the pit that was dug for them, meaning they didn't die. The lions didn't eat Daniel. The fire didn't get them. Only their enemy went to their death there. But Jesus took all into death with him. He got justice by seeing the end of the reign of his enemies, but all was laid upon him. All the sin, all the guilt, all the blame. Come on, this is, that is very different. I can go for the other method. Right. That's glorious. <laughs> it's glorious. Yeah, that's right. Um, he was innocent, but he died anyway. That's not fair. We're not dealing with civil court. We're dealing with the cross. And he understood what he was doing. He wasn't murdered. 
He was a living, he was a sacrifice, okay? Um, he was innocent, but he died anyway. The difference between us and Jesus is that the pit that they dig for him was the cross and not just a bad situation, and that's the key. Ours is not the cross. I mean, it should be. We can bring the cross into every situation, but ours is just a bad situation. If it is, then deal with it like a bad situation. But if you can walk like a son of God, then it's the cross. You can bring it into every area of your life and get through this. But our pet has nothing to do with the cross, but only with mistreatment by evil men that demands that justice be given. This is, is not bad. It is God's provision for his people, but it has nothing to do with conforming to the image of Christ because God put a sense of injustice even in sinners. All right? Okay. That's it. Take a break. Come back for the next